um, we'll be looking at the draft document that has been prepared by the subcommittee today that addresses pediatric sedation in the state of California and the safety of proceeding with pediatric uh, sedation. Today with me representing the board, as well as the subcommittee that's been appointed to work on this project, is Dr. Bruce Witcher. Dr. Witcher uh, is a professional member of the board and also an oral surgeon. Also on the subcommittee is Meredith McKenzie. Ms. McKenzie is a public member of the board and also is an attorney. As you know, over the last several months, the subcommittee has been very busy trying to look at the statute and regulations and guidelines in California relating to pediatric sedation. They've taken this information and gathered national data from all states related to the same subject topic. Uh, before you today is that document and what they have put together. Um, the subcommittee's made every effort to verify accuracy of what's in the report. Um, however, as I'm sure you all know, uh, variability, complexity, uh, the fact that state laws and regulations change often, it's a moving target. So this report may include some inaccuracies. That's why we're counting on your eyes to have seen the report, read the report, and help us to clarify areas that may need clarifications or may be inaccurate. Uh, in addition, as part of this report will be statistics that were gathered by board staff uh, related to deaths and hospitalizations that were reported by licensees in response to the reporting requirement of Business and Profession Code 1680C. So um, this is a working document and I hope you all have had the opportunity to read it because we will be going through it section by section to see if you have any comments. Your comments are valuable. Um, and we're looking forward to the input that we're going to get from this, not only this meeting, but meetings going forward. Uh, you will note that there are no recommendations from the subcommittee at this time. And that's because we're hoping for public input. Um, the recommendations will be developed along the way. And the board hopes that actually consensus recommendations can be developed with input from all interested parties. The recent tragic events underscore the importance of us doing this study. And the board, as well as everyone in this room in attendance has expressed and will continue to express our deepest sympathy for all tragic events that have occurred during a dental procedure. We are all committed, as you, as you have as a, evidenced in attending this meeting, to making every effort to ensure that pediatric dental treatment in, is safe in California. With this, is my, with this in mind, I respectfully request that participants focus remarks on the report we have before us. This meeting is being webcast uh, in live time, but it will also be available once it's archived by the department for viewing at a later date. So we're memorializing this. You'll be able to go back and look at it again. And uh, our purpose today we're sitting at the front listening to what you have to say, writing notes, but it, we will also be using it as a reference going back to make sure we've captured everything that people wanted to comment on. Uh, we anticipate the meeting will conclude around 3.30, but that will depend on you. Um, rest assured that if we do, con whatever time we do conclude won't, will not be the end of this discussion. It's just the beginning. We anticipate having other meetings as necessary to take public input. We want to make sure everybody's heard. And um, moving forward, there will be additional opportunities to comment as the board moves through this study and incorporate your comments into the final document. We anticipate going through the document today section by section. So we're first going to be looking at the background. We'll next be looking at the laws in California compared to other states. Uh, then we'll be reviewing the professional guidelines. And lastly, we'll be looking at statistics. Uh, if you would like to comment, I invite you to rise to either this microphone that's right here in the middle, or if you'd like to raise your hand, we will bring a remote mic to you. Um, the best way to ensure, um, uh, excuse me, um, 
we would like for you to identify who you are when you approach the microphone. This is a number of reasons why we do this. The people who are watching on the webcast may not be able to see the web class all that clearly, but if you mention who your name is, every time you approach the microphone, they'll be able to identify you. Um, I hope you'll have taken the opportunity to sign in. If you haven't, I would encourage you to do so. This is the way we'll be able to keep you in the loop for any additional documents that come out, any email blasts, uh, any way we need to get in contact with you. Um, so that concludes my remarks at this point. Let's begin the work ahead of us. Um, we need to start looking at identifying the challenge within the practice of sedation in dentistry and hopefully come to a consensus on how best to move forward to ensure public protection in the state of California. And at that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Witcher, who will start with the, with the background part of the document. Any questions on procedure? Awesome. We're off to a good start. One, Thank you. One point, really quick oh, um, Larry Trapp, I'm at Loma Linda University. Uh, however, I want to, uh, the terminology in this area is, is uh, really difficult. Uh, you just introduced this as an evaluation of sedation. And um, I'm of the impression that Dr. Uh, Senator, Senator Hill's letter was about safety for anesthesia and sedation. Uh, I think most mortalities involve anesthesia in some way, so I wouldn't see it like to see it limited to sedation. Does that make sense? Okay. And I think that this is what we're going to find as we move through how we define what we're talking about. And so, as a non-dentist, I say sedation, meaning oral conscious sedation, conscious sedation, general anesthesia, and we've even thrown in the <coughs> review of the use of local anesthetic. And so, I mean, while you're right, Senator Hill's request was to primarily focused on general anesthesia, the board, since this is such a major study, has decided to open it up and look at it all. We don't know whether or not that will be helpful. We hope so. But we want to make sure that we're not limiting the discussion and making it transparent for all people to comment. So thank you for your con comment, Dr. Trout. Hi, Sarah Huckle with Senator Hill's office and Business and Professions Committee. I just wanted to commend the board and also um, emphasize that Hill supports the expansion of the original request. Okay. We will have staff, um, if you don't want to approach the mic, just raise your hand. We will have staff um, get to you as quickly as possible. We're not going to have a mic up here, so uh, the intent is to hear from you. Um, and if we need, to, if a question is asked and we need to respond, we'll, we'll deal with that when we come to it. So at that, we can get started. Thank you for that introduction, Karen, and I think she summarized the way we've chosen to approach this today. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Dr. Bruce Witcher. I'm a dentist member on the board, and uh, here, along with my co-committee chair, is Meredith McKenzie, to, uh, to walk everybody through this report. And, and as she so rightly pointed out, uh, the goal here is to receive your input. We want to make sure this is a comprehensive report. Uh, within the scope of what we've been asked to do, of course, and, and to incorporate as much input from as many interested parties as possible. Uh, just procedurally, the way I would like to work through this is you've probably noticed that it is divided roughly into four sections. Uh, the first is some introductory background material to more or less frame the discussion, a little bit of history of anesthesia, history of the board, some of the anesthesia-related legislation, uh, leading on into um, some specific sections that govern uh, sedation and general anesthesia in California, as Dr. Trapp pointed out. This is designed to be a comprehensive document. Uh, the focus really is, uh, as you'll read through this, you'll see it's more moderate sedation by whatever route on up through deep sedation and general anesthesia, because that is the title of our enabling legislation that mentions general anesthesia. So, 
Um, do you have any comments? Okay, with that, um, <clears throat> what I'll do is we'll just start at the top of the document. Um, I'm not going to go through it section by section. I'm assuming everybody's read it, uh, but if there are specific points related to that first section on background up through where we go into the review of state laws, and let me, I'll find the page here for you. Um, So is, uh, is there any comment on the first section? Uh, let me oblige you. <laughs> um, thank you. Uh, I want to comment that uh, I think the committee could better uh, numerically develop the document. Um, that we use page numbers in the first portion of the document. In the appendices, some appendices have page numbers, some don't. Uh, I would appreciate, uh, for example, labeling it page A and then A1 as the page, or labeling the appendix A, or, or some other symbol you care to use, but then uh, in the body of that appendix, have A1, A2, A3, so we can talk, it's very difficult to talk about when you restart the numbering in the same document at different places, and that's what's done. Uh, secondly, is that uh, I wanted in the background, there are two things I wanted to comment on. Uh, I would like it to appear in there somewhere that the importance of this is, this is relevant to the importance that dentists are credited by many as the discoverers of anesthesia. And that's important if, as to why it's part of our documents and why patients uh, um, have wanted to, us to provide it. It's, uh, th that discovery was in 1846. Um, dentists weren't as active as they could be, but the discovery concept was debated in the courts as well as in professional societies for 50 years. Okay, So that's the first suggestion. Um, the second suggestion is in the, the development of the history, uh, it pretty much stops in 1953 with the creation of the ADSA. There's been a rich history since 1980. Uh, um, with well, I was the founding president of a national uh, dental anesthesiology uh, society, uh, which has grown considerably over that time. And then we now have a board uh, and something like 200 diplomates of that board nationally. Um, and they participate at pretty much every level of anesthesia nationally. So I would like that to make sure that that's noted in that uh, history. Okay, and that's for this section. That's all I have. Thank you. Any other comments? We're talking about pages basically one through eight ending with the table that details uh, the current uh, board permit statistics. How many permittees we have? Yes, sir. Hi. Uh, my name is Mark Singleton. I'm a board certified pediatric anesthesiologist and I'm on the faculty at Stanford uh, and UCSF and uh, on the medical staff at uh, Oakland Children's Hospital. Um, and all those, those are academic credentials. I've spent 30 years in private practice in San Jose where I took care of a lot of dental cases and oral surgeon office cases too. So I've sort of had the whole spectrum. Uh, and I knew your dad, um, who was an anesthesiologist at Stanford, great guy. Um, I wanted to just speak to the definitions um, and also comment and, and commend uh, the committee for uh, broadening the scope of this examination in pediatric uh, sedation and anesthesia to the entire spectrum uh, because uh, one of the things that uh, the American Society of Anesthesiologists has recognized for decades and promoted to the Joint Commission and others which have accepted it as a concept is that uh, sedation uh, and uh, this applies to pediatric sedation as well as adults Sedation is a continuum of conscience, consciousness, and uh, although the intended level of sedation may be described as minimal or moderate, uh, and I'll talk about the, the difficulty with those terms in a second, um, 
those intended states are often targets that are difficult to uh, arrive at and stay within. And so when we talk about sedation, we really need to think of it as a continuum from uh, a point of conscious sedation where a patient is awake uh, through a state where uh, protective reflexes and the ability to engage with uh, the patient's environment are gradually impaired to the state where they are completely insensible to um, stimulus and often lose protective reflexes and um, don't breathe. And uh, those, those uh, impaired states are the ones that anesthesiologists feel the most comfortable with. We love it when our patients don't breathe and don't move and don't do any of those things. Uh, but we really are, uh, I think, need to focus very critically on that continuum and the fact that uh, patients can move from one state to the other uh, in a way that we don't often intend. And that is really uh, at the heart of this matter. Um, it, the terms minimal sedation and moderate sedation are ones that are uh, problematic uh, because they don't actually describe the patient's state. Um, it's uh, much more, uh, and the other terms are well defined within this uh, document. I found, I found the definitions to be fairly precise. Uh, but describing a state of consciousness or a state of sedation as either conscious or uh, deep sedation is well described here, but I think that we need to have some sort of uh, um, uniformity of terms within regulation, uh, within statute, and uh, within uh, the way we talk about them within our professional society. So thank you. Any additional comments on this section? Thank you. Uh, we had some other input on definitions, and I would like to remind, uh, point out to everyone that there is a couple. There are a couple of definitions in the definition section that I plan to revise. One is uh, the definition of uh, general anesthesia. It's uh, the intent here is to go with the um, ASA definition uh, and because we believe that is the most current. It has some physiologic parameters included in it. So you may, that one sort of got by me, so we're going to make that correction. <laughs> but thank you for uh, bringing up this point. Anything else? Yes, Dr. Trent. Um, okay. Thank you. I, I feel like some perspective is necessary here. And when you get old, you can give a lot more perspective. Um, the original... Um, General anesthesia regs were written, and I was at the committee, and so was Roger Kingston, who I saw here, and a few others. Uh, in 19 in the 80s, was as a result of three deaths by in a dental office by the same person within a six-month period, and that generated, and that person went to prison, as a matter of fact. Um, but we unfortunately have always had stimuli to uh, of poor outcomes to get us to move. I guess so that's human nature. Uh, but at, at any rate, um, that perspective is important. Uh, the, I, I particularly want to point out that in the uh, blue, so-called Blue Ribbon Panel that met in the early 2000s, which I was on as well, um, uh, created a permit. It was said in here that there was really no discussion or objection to what went on at that committee. Um, and that was, I want to correct that. Uh, there were at least two of us, and I can name the committee members and the two who dis disagreed, if you like, um, uh, that uh, disagreed on, get, on creating the adult sedation permit for the so-called DOCS group that was pre present, a representative was present at that meeting. That meeting did something that I could never agree with, and that is, um, uh, agree to have a permit for people who would give uh, controlled substances beyond the FDA recommendations. And uh, it was well beyond those recommendations. And so if, if the committee reviews that and sees fit, I hope they would. Uh, I, that's something I, I hate for the board in any way 
to condone by giving a permit. And if you're uncertain of that, that review of that as well. Thank you. Hi, thank you for inviting all the stakeholders. I'm Mark Sikowski, president of the California Society of Anesthesiologists. Um, I thank you and support what I hope you intend to do, which is to adopt the definitions for light, moderate, deep, general anesthesia that the American Society of Anesthesiologists already has as a standard that's been widely adopted across the country. I would point out, um, since we're talking about the definitions, um, you know, it doesn't matter whether it's inhaled, intravenous, transcutaneous, oral. You know, the basic pharmacology is not the route of administration, but the absorption and the des and desired effect, which determines that. And then whether you're moderate sedation effect or deep general, um, that should determine the level of monitoring. And all patients deserve one standard of care across the continuum. So it doesn't matter if it's in the hospital or the surgery center or the office. The level of... De of anesthetic um, level achieved should determine the amount of monitoring and personnel required. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, if there's no further comments, I'd like to move on to the next stage section, which was a comparison between California law and state law. Uh, just by way of background, we, um, we use some secondary sources for this review, and those references are available. <clears throat> I think you can actually find them on the internet fairly easily. Uh, where the secondary sources didn't have enough information, we did go to the actual dental board regulations of that state. This was very arduous. And, um, we did the best we could. We did reach a few states where uh, it was necessary. Uh, we, there probably would be a legal interpretation necessary from that state. And, and so the, there's only a few of those, though. So we, we put in the most general comments uh, and, and tried to form you know, a broad picture of how our laws uh, conform uh, to the others that are across the, across the country. And uh, <clears throat> there is a... Uh, sort of a discussion and summary of those in this section. So I'll open this up uh, for your comments. Can you identify the section specifically that we're covering? Which page is Oh, uh, this would be page nine. And, and there's information in the appendices. Uh, in appendix one, there's some tables that attempt to, subs uh, that attempt to summarize this. <coughs> So it, it, this ends on page 22, so 9 through 22. I apologize, Dr. Witcher. Uh, I'd like to make a comment on uh, page 8, the permits, uh, before we completely leave that section. Sure. Um, I, I, I'm not a dentist, and I'm not that familiar with uh, dental regulations, but I, I, was, uh, I found it interesting uh, in looking at these. I think there are five permits that the dental board issues that two of them were stratified by adult and pediatric in terms of conscious uh, oral sedation or oral conscious sedation. Um, and from, from our point of view of, as anesthesiologists, uh, we, we and the American College of Surgeons, the American College of Pediatrics has uh, uh, in, over the last several decades really come to believe that there is a big difference in the ability to care for uh, children as distinguished from adults in sed uh, procedural sedation. Uh, the American Society of Anesthesiologists uh, uh, has adopted a separate board certification over the last several years for pediatric anesthesiologists. 
all of the focus has been on uh, the risk stratification and the recognition that children uh, present higher risks, especially at younger ages than adults. So while I think it's great that there are two distinct uh, age uh, stratified permits for uh, oral conscious sedation, I think that that distinction should very definitely extend into deeper levels of sedation uh, and especially general anesthesia. Uh, we believe very strongly, and the uh, American uh, College of Surgeons has also uh, recently developed a recognition through a program uh, of pediatric surgical verification of uh, uh, facilities that do pediatric surgery that special qualifications for providers need to be uh, uh, or are applicable to the care of pediatric patients. So we would like to see you know, this most vulnerable population recognized in the areas where the highest level of risk occurs, which is in general anesthesia and especially deep sedation. Uh, in some ways, general anesthesia is perhaps safer than that deep sedation area where you know, uh, perhaps an unprotected airway uh, might be lost, and um, so there will be more to talk about there, but thank you for that. State laws. Hello. Uh, my name is Michael Mashney. I'm a dentist anesthesiologist. I was um, full-time faculty at Loma Linda University for seven years when I finished, and I'm in private practice now. Currently hold a part-time, very part-time position at USC. Uh, I'm speaking on behalf of the American Society of Dentist Anesthesiologists as well as myself. Uh, I've got a couple comments regarding this section. First, at the bottom of page, or not the bottom, but on page 19, it talks about the age for um, California for pediatric patients. And, of course, a lot of different states have different ages and different groups have different societies. Mine, in California, it says the requirement was age 13 or under, and I couldn't find that. I know the oral conscious sedation permit in California says 12 and under. So is there somewhere, can we clarify, is it actually 13 and under? Because everything I've seen has been 12 and under in California. That, that it's in the, uh, in the conscious sedation, oral conscious sedation regs. If it's in there, I'm, you know, if I'm off by a year, we'll certainly make that correction. Okay. Just, just check that. Yeah, thank you. Um, the second part is back on page 17, and, um, or actually page, starts on page 16, where it says specialty training for dental assistants. And in one section, they say that, you know, that we're unable to identify any state that requires the presence of a registered nurse or other medical professional during sedation or anesthesia for dental treatment. And I think that's the issue here, because if you look outside of dental treatment, nowhere is someone with 110 hours allowed to reconstitute drugs, monitor a patient, and push propofol. In the hospital, that's just not allowed. Maybe uh, I can get some comments here from there, but um, a registered nurse can't push propofol. A dental sedation assistant can't give local. How can they push propofol or give a general anesthetic agent? So the recommendation here would be to abolish the dental sedation assistant. Uh, I think it, its goal is to try to make a, a team concept look safer, but I think it actually accomplishes just the opposite. Thank you. Any additional comments on state laws? Um, a comment, uh, as many of you already know, um, the difficulties with surveying states are, are huge in dentistry. And this is where medicine has such a different structure. It's hard to compare because we don't have a hospital department which manages what we do, but rather, or, or tries to control what we do, but rather uh, state, depart uh, state uh, agencies. The uh, Dallas Daily News in, in December of 2015 uh, ran a seven-part series, and um, originally I expected it to be directed differently, but the direction of the year-and-a-half-long preparation, he said, the reporter indicated was that uh, he surveyed departments of, of, of uh, I'm sorry, department, um, dental uh, uh, agencies across the country and found 
a, a total disparity between record keeping. Uh, some of the records were collected and then uh, eliminated intentionally. Uh, that the some of the states didn't collect nearly as much data as others. S some had differences in definitions. Um, so I, I think at least if you look at that article and, and uh, talk to that individual, your, your expectations for any meaningful uh, uh, data coming from other states is not very good. Uh, and so I just, I don't want, I, although I appreciate the, 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 the um, committee uh, looking, uh, but I, I, my expectations from what I've seen and what I've read uh, is very low in terms of the record keeping of the other states. And, and I think this article, if, if we weren't doing this because of maybe some, some terrible, terrible outcomes, and I really want to address that we're all saddened by, uh, anybody who treats children is saddened particularly by these very young children's deaths. Uh, but um, uh, I think we, we have, the state has to press on as we're doing I think Senator, I think Senator, thank Senator Hill for his letter. I'm sorry it had to come from a poor outcome, but I think we're going in the right direction. We should have been looked at safety more for years, and uh, um, and so I, I just think I'm, I, I encourage the committee, but don't expect much out of the state uh, data. I'll just hold the farm ponies. <laughs> Thank you for that. Anything else on comparison of state laws? Okay, final call. Seeing none, beginning on page 22, we'll go to the next section where we were asked to compare basically state policies, regulations with uh, dental association guidelines. Uh, we took a little liberty here because we had stakeholder comments from a couple of medical groups, uh, uh, American Academy of Pediatrics and of course uh, California Society of Anesthesiologists and uh, you'll see a section where we've taken up <clears throat> uh, limited analysis of, of what they sent in. So I'll open it up for discussion of uh, basically professional association guidelines. Hi, I'm Paula Whiteman. I'm here to represent the American Academy of Pediatrics. And I sit on the governing board of the statewide American Academy of Pediatrics of California. For California, American Academy of Pediatrics, this is one of our top priorities. We wish we could have been involved from the start instead of as an external stakeholder. We feel that we care for the whole child we help clear them preoperatively, and unfortunately, if there's a bad outcome, we're there to hold the hand of the family and continue that relationship afterwards. So I appreciate the gentleman's comment when he states that it's unfortunate that children have died to bring this discussion forward. We also want to state that we have no financial stake in this. Uh, so in terms of the guidelines, the American Academy of Pediatrics with the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry do have the joint guidelines, which the previous draft is within this document, but a new uh, set of guidelines just was published this month. and. I want to also follow up on what uh, the, this gentleman said here in terms of moderate versus deep sedation. It's a continuum based on a report from 2002 uh, from the anesthesiologists that you cannot predict whether intentionally or unintentionally giving medications whether a child is going to have minimum minimal sedation versus moderate or deep. So the language where it says on page 20 that you don't necessarily have to have a second 
individual administering the medicine and monitoring the airway does not make any sense because that does not follow the current recommendations. So I, I think that needs to be changed and our position is there needs to be a, a qualified individual doing the sedation and a different person doing the procedure. So I am a pediatric emergency physician. I do sedation and I do procedures, but in a hospital, it's illegal for me to do both. And a procedure is a procedure. So there needs to be somebody doing the sedation. I have to be the one that pushes a propofol. A nurse cannot push propofol. I have to monitor the airway when someone else is doing the procedure or else I have to get another physician to do the sedation. So that would be nice if this document follows the recommendations of the AAP, AAPD, and mandates two physicians. Because you cannot say that minimal sedation only needs one when you can't guarantee that that child is only going to be in minimal sedation. Thank you. If, just in response, I, we did receive the 2016 update. We did review it. We didn't quite have time to get the changes in here. It's fairly similar, I believe, on the point that you raised, however. Hi, I'm Michael Mashney again. I know initially there was some discussion regarding, you know, the operator and aesthetist at the same time. And the questions everybody came to me and said is, you know, where's the evidence? Where's the evidence that's less safe? You know, and CDA, in fact, you know, was asking the same thing. Well, I believe CDA has the information. I'm going to give you an example of, of some evidence of why it is. I'm a dentist anesthesiologist. I'm insured by TDIC, which is owned by the California Dental Association. My policy restricts me to doing only anesthesia at the same time. I can't do anesthesia and the surgery at the same time. I can, it's legal, but my classification at the insurance company changes up to that similar to an oral surgeon, and my rates double. Why does it double? Because the actuaries and the insurance companies know it's more risky. Following on the uh, comments made by the representative from the American Academy of Pediatrics, uh, of which I'm also a member, uh, the California Society of Anesthesiologists fully endorses this uh, recent update and uh, the information contained in it. Uh, we think that uh, there's a lot of uh, good things in there. I'm not sure how much uh, the dental board wants to describe the practice of dentistry in its most minute details, but um, also on page 21 is a, um, a statement that says that California law does not say anything about a uh, period of fasting prior to uh, sedation or anesthesia. Um, certainly that is a standard of care uh, for all anesthetic uh, and, and sedation procedures. Again, uh, going back to the point that we can never tell when a patient's going to lose consciousness, but any material in the stomach presents an unacceptable risk uh, in, in that circumstance. So that would be something that... And uh, we also feel very strongly that uh, there should be a uh, member of the team uh, whose qualifications are uh, indicated by uh, the age of the patient, uh, the complexity of the procedure, and. Uh, contemplated and any existing uh, comorbidities or uh, coexisting disease that uh, that describe the risk uh, uh, posed by that patient, that that provider should be solely devoted to monitoring the patient's vital signs and most importantly, breath to breath adequacy of ventilation. By the time a patient uh, desaturates on oximetry, uh, their airway has pr probably been compromised for several seconds. 
the time to actually save lives, these kids that are dying in, in, that we've seen reports about as, late, as recently as a week ago, uh, the time to rescue them is when that first breath is missed. Uh, either from an obstructed airway or from a patient losing their ability to breathe because of uh, the polypharmacy that's been administered in whatever form, by oral or intravenous sedation. Uh, we really feel very strongly that uh, assurance of the adequacy of ventilation is an absolute standard and that there should be one person solely devoted to monitoring that uh, so that the team can be um, appraised of the fact that there is trouble starting well in advance of oxygen desaturation. And, and just to follow on this point, I think it's fantastic that everybody who participates in uh, pediatric sedation in a dental uh, setting has PAL certification, has great training, has gone to courses and learned how to intubate patients, and has done all of those things in, to enable them to become rescuers and to do resuscitation. However, no matter how well you've trained and what your credentials are, if you virtually never encounter that experience, it's extremely unlikely that you're going to be able to perform that uh, with uh, any kind of reliability or predictability if it's something you encounter almost never. Uh, we rescue airways every single day as anesthesiologists, so it's, it's part of our, our normal game. Uh, but to expect somebody to be able to do that in the chaos of a catastrophic uh, code blue situation is, is something I think that we will never achieve uh, the, the life-saving uh, goal of, of this gathering. Instead, we need to focus on prevention. We need to prevent these things from happening, and the way to do that is early detection, early monitoring. So you're going to hear about capnography, uh, but really, the, the, no matter how you do that, you must assure that, that this child breathes every single breath. And when that doesn't happen, you know about it immediately. All the people in this room that are professionally trained know what a big story all of this is, and there's very little time uh, to, to devote to it. Uh, but um, in, inst in, in other, or other groups giving recommendations, one of the things that's not addressed as often as I think it should be is the development of the airway and the physiology in children. A, children, a child at two is different from a child at eight. A child, in, and I think you alluded to the very young ages, are, is really different. Um, the, the whole way you manipulate rescue is different. And uh, how much time you have to do the rescue varies. So um, it's hard for groups to give input on the management of cases when they may not be as very familiar with the rescue that you need to do to get out of the bad situation. And uh, that's one of the things that I think as, as these drafts go on, we will get closer to is uh, just how much that is. Um, I wanted to mention uh, if our, our, well, next section. next section, okay. Um, Anyone else on professional association guidelines? Okay, seeing none, next we'll move on to the literature review. This is a difficult area of research. I think anybody who has attempted to delve into this literature would agree to that. So uh, your input would be most welcome. I'll just make a comment and then turn over to the next person. But um, I, I, the article in the Dallas Morning News, when he tried to, to review the literature, he concluded the same thing I have when I've tried to get data. You, you, it's just non-existent in any meaningful 
numbers, take home and change things kind of way. Dental boards just are not, have not historically collected data in a way that we can use. And, and again, I, I think I alluded to before, I, I just my expectations there are low. Um, that doesn't mean that we can't do it ourselves. And I think what's important is for us to develop a, ultimately, a um, publicly available database, number one, that is, uh, puts poor outcomes without identifying data, uh, that is available to the public, and uh, I see that ultimately it just has to be done, but I'll leave it for your discretion. Uh, there's one thing also I wanted to point out, and I, d for those of you who don't know uh, the board very well, doc the current president is Dr. Stephen Morrow, and he by law can't be here. He works in my institution. I've talked to him about this. Uh, he, he has said if nobody minded, he would appreciate if I would describe what goes on when there is a poor outcome in dentistry. I'm a reviewer for the board and have been for many years. Um, and I, I think everybody wants an answer right today about where, why our patient is, why the poor outcome that happened a week ago, why don't we know more information? Well, the process has to be understood. And what, when somebody has a poor outcome, the state board has investigators which are assigned, they have to be assigned to a case, they collect data. Now, what data are collected? I inevitably, and I and tend to be involved with uh, either deaths or uh, mostly deaths, um, I have to see the office records, I have to get a copy of the um, hospital records, which may entail ICU stay if it's a prolonged uh, neuroport neurologic outcome that eventually dies. Um, uh, and the ER data as well. Uh, I then have to see the coroner's report if it's a death and um, go over every one of those and write in a format that explains why I'm going to conclude what I conclude and it's kind of a is issued format. Um, but it takes the investigator, if any of you have ever tried to get hospital data on another patient, on a patient. You're going to know it takes a lot of time. It's a very time consuming process <laughs> to get the coroner's report. A talk study, how long does a talk study take? Six weeks to two months. Uh, all this means that the reviewer, the person, me, that I'm going to write the report, I don't get all the data for a year. That's frequently what it is. So then I have to write the report and if I'm in full time practice as I was for many years, 24 years, uh, that uh, I have to then find the time to write the report, then I have to send it back to the investigator, and the investigator then takes it to the board. So uh, it is, we are not going to find out about poor outcomes immediately, and I, don't, I just don't think we should expect that. Um, the other thing is, one more suggestion I have for the board is that we create a database of expert opinions, reviewers, and that board be, a, that that database be available to all reviewers. That way, if another reviewer sees I'm not doing a good job, he can say something. And, and, and so we all are kind of leveling out the quality of the review we do. Okay? And sometimes, by the way, you get data that you don't expect. I've had physicians' letters from the coroner's office, who are consultants for the coroner's office, make comments or ask questions, and even indicate it's a board review case. Okay, so there's just a lot of work goes into it. You just don't see it. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, anyone else on the literature review? Okay, seeing none, we'll move on to the last section, which is statistics. And I'm, I'm going to let Ms. Fisher lead the discussion on that or respond to questions if there are any that, that require an answer. And I'll chime in if needed. So is this on the statistics? Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, if you, on the, I think it was about page 118 of the uh, PDF files. So I don't know what number uh, it was in there. But I think this kind of sums up the whole 
the whole problem we have here. Back in 2012, I, I made a request to the dental board to get the data on the 55 reported deaths that were between 2008 and 2011. Um, the board actually originally said they would give it to me. They actually charged me a fee, cashed my check, said give me 30 days. 30 days later, Dr. Mashney, we won't give you that information. Why? Because we don't have to. And they sent me my check back. And so this data has been, you know, kept secret the whole time. When you look at the, um, the data at the bottom, there's 45 hospitalizations and nine deaths that were reported. But if you look in the description above it, it says that they queried the database from the Department of Consumer Affairs and there were approximately 325 incidents identified for a six-year period. So six years, six times 52 is 312 weeks. In 312 weeks in California, we've had 325 reports of a patient going to the hospital or dying. It's over one a week. So I think that highlights the problem here is we don't know the information. Then the board gets into how they purge charts, how, how they, if there's nothing wrong or they find no fault, they get rid of the chart. So a lot of those information, so what this says here is, yes, we've got nine deaths and 45 hospitalizations, but we don't have them all. But do we know how many there were that you couldn't get a hold of? Um, so I think my recommendation would be, number one, remove the age filter. I'd ask Senator Hill's office, take the age filter off. Why are we, I mean, kids are important, trust me. I treat kids all the time. I don't like treating adults. but. Um, why are we not looking at, if we're looking at and opening it up, why not keep statistics on everything? Because it will come back later. Um, number two, um, can they be identified? And then, and then it discusses, you know, the in-house consultants. I think it would be help to know who is reviewing these cases. I think the committee that Dr. Trapp spoke of and that the Blue Ribbon Committee actually recommended years ago that there be a multidisciplinary committee to review all cases would be a good thing. And then as far as the data, um, you know, when, when you cover this data, it's like, what do, we, what do you collect? Well, my feeling is you collect everything you can. You want to know, for, at the minimum, the age of the patient, patient the ASA classification, did they have any pre-existing medical conditions? Uh, did they take any medications or have any allergies? What was the planned procedure? Where was it done? Was it a hospital, a surgery center, a dental office? Was it, um, who were the individuals in the room? You know, you don't have to identify the individuals, but the NPI classification would tell you if it was a, a general dentist, pediatric dentist, um, or if there was, they didn't have one, it would be an assistant. You'd like to know what kind of medications were used. Was it general anesthesia, deep sedation, local anesthesia? Um, none. You know, would like to know that. Did this, did this, was it a heart attack in the waiting room with someone that was with the patient that wasn't even in the office? I mean, we don't know how many of these, uh, clearly the 325 weren't all, um, children and they weren't all anesthesia patients, but the fact is that's the answer is we don't know and that's what we need to find out by collecting this data. Um, the description of the events and any, any write-up and the outcomes of the investigation. So by tracking all that information and having a committee to review it, I think we'll get more information on how we can prevent it in the future. I think ultimately um, the board is looking at, I'm told, uh, and I, let me go backward. Give, uh, current law requires that a dentist who, ha who hospitalized somebody uh, subsequent to dental care uh, or has a death, that he has to report to the board and say that he's had such activity. Um, the, we do, the law doesn't specify how that we report. I think what we need to do, as I think Dr. Mashney just alluded to, is develop an extensive reporting form that the, the uh, DBC could have on their website that anybody who has a poor outcome could download, fill out, and that would help initiate the investigation I described. And I, I think the material that's in there is up for discussion. It could be ridiculously long, and maybe it should be, but we, we need to decide as a group what we need on there so that our database begins to develop. And, and as our database develops, I think we're gonna be able to assign safety. We're gonna be able to effectively discuss safety, but it's gonna take a while to develop the numbers, but I think that's a start is a form. 
Um, it's a good thing we all sat right here in this corner <laughs> so we just hand the microphone back and forth to each other. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I, I also want to speak to the importance of uh, data gathering and uh, how, how um, knowing, knowing what's out there helps to inform us and make us better practitioners. Uh, and just going back to the literature section, nobody said anything, but uh, I want to commend uh, and draw attention to the fact that a great deal of those uh, li uh, articles that were cited are from the anesthesia uh, literature. Uh, and people like Charlie Cote and Joe Cavero, uh, who have done a lot of work on pediatric sedation, the big thrust is um, we need a reporting system. We need to know what's happening. And, and um, it was mentioned that dentistry is a little bit different. Those of us who work in hospitals, we are uh, within the context of a medical staff. When an adverse outcome occurs, we have a root cause analysis, and all of these things are you know, very much exposed uh, for the good of all of us uh, to improve our, our practices and uh, to uh, enhance patient safety going forward. The American Society of Anesthesiologists has a national anesthesia outcomes uh, clinical registry. Uh, we're all trying to find ways of getting data into that registry. As a part of that, there is something called the uh, Anesthesia Incident Reporting System, which is an anonymous uh, uh, reporting uh, capacity so that when you have a near miss in your uh, practice, you can send in a description of what happened uh, anonymously. Uh, I think a, a great barrier to us learning about what we all do in our little uh, areas of the world uh, and, and the, the problems that we encounter and the risks to patient safety that, safety that we see, um, we, we tend to feel uh, like somebody will come down on us, that there will be a punishment. There, and this, I see this in, at the level of residents to my peers and colleagues. We are just naturally averse to admitting when we've done something that had a bad outcome. And I think that whatever the board does that enhances the ability to find that information and to encourage it to come, to come forth uh, in some anonymized uh, fashion, I think would be extremely helpful to improving care. I'm Roger Kingston. Uh, I'm in private practice, oral and maxillofacial surgery, and I'm fully trained in dental anesthesiology as well. Um, I was going to come and observe, but I can't help but say this. Um, we, I think after reviewing the document, uh, we all recognize how much work went into collecting this uh, literature review, and also that it, it's pretty inadequate, really, nationally uh, and across all specialties. Um, one of the complaints about the, the adequacy of the literature that was mentioned more than once in your report is the lack of a denominator in incident reports. Now the uh, oral and maxillofacial surgery national insurance company, which insures about 80 percent of the oral surgeons in this country, uh, collects data annually on how many anesthetics of, of all different types were administered by each one of their policyholders every year. And it occurs to me, um, the California Dental Board can only be concerned about what happens in California, but we do have a reporting system for um, um, adverse effects, adverse events. Um, but we don't collect any uh, information on that denominator. And as a board, you could because you review, you renew a license every couple of years. And why not make part, why not re make reporting the number of anesthesia cases of all the different sorts uh, as part of the application for renewal of a, of a sedation or general anesthesia license? That's my suggestion. I believe that's part of our current licensing process to query the data bank. <clears throat> and
Any other questions on our statistics? Well, if, if there are no other questions on that section, I'll open it up to any remarks on the document as a whole. Gail Matthew, California Dental Association. I just wanted to provide a clarification for the group. Dr. Mashney had made a comment about TDIC premiums and it being somehow a demonstration of risk. I didn't know that, so I emailed TDIC and I said, can you explain this? So for clarification, the uh, premium is higher for someone who provides anesthesia than a general dentist who does not provide anesthesia because of the risks that are associated there. Uh, with providing anesthesia. It has nothing to do with other provider models or how many people in the room or anything else. It's, it's specific to the risk that's associated. And uh, the email that I received back is, said that it was consistent with what is true in the medical community as well, if you're providing anesthesia or not. So for clarification. Hello, my name is Melanie Rowe. I'm a CRNA, Certified Registered Nurse Anesthetist. And on behalf of the California Association of Nurse Anesthetists, we just wanted to say that we support and recommend a dedicated provider, including CRNAs, for all pediatric dental procedures. Thank you. I'm going off my policy. Let's read the exact wording. Uh, there's no question that the anesthesia, my policy is more expensive than a general dentist. That wasn't my point. I think I, maybe I didn't make myself clear. But under my, my policy, and I'll read, Dentist anesthesiologist using any anesthetic or modality of administration. Classification does not include administration of general anesthesia or parental sedation if the insured is also doing the dental procedure. If I want to do both at the same time, my rates do go up. They classify me different than, than as a dentist anesthesiologist. So it's clear, my rates, trust me, they're much higher than a, dentist than a general dentist. I'm not d disputing that. But if I choose to do both at the same time, my risks, my rates go up even higher from here. So if you clarify that. If there's no other comments, I'd like to thank you all for coming. I think this has been incredibly valuable. I really appreciate the input. Um, moving forward, as uh, Ms. Fisher said, we'll certainly incorporate a lot of these suggestions into the document. Uh, we'll be coming out with some probably uh, corrected draft. Uh, it will take us a little time to assimilate all this and come out with draft recommendations. Uh, we are looking forward to having another session to go over those sometime after the August board meeting. Um, we'll see how we do and give everybody as much notice as possible because we'd like to see you all back for the next round because this has been this has been very positive and very helpful and I'd especially like to thank you all for helping me address this this very important and serious issue uh, Dr. Trapp request for more than a week's notice yeah I'm sorry about yes we will definitely definitely I said as much notice as possible thank you